know about contemporary slavery, you know about human trafficking, you know about some of these new rules, um, but I want to bring you some of the latest uh, information and some of the latest findings of how we're applying social science in particular, but other types of sciences to explore this uh, and, uh, and to open that up and, and to say, while if, it, if it's still a newish issue to you, that's fine. Uh, we're all on a fairly steep learning curve, and I say that as someone who's been working specifically on contemporary forms of slavery for over 20 years now, and I still feel that I'm on, on quite a learning curve. So I want to talk about how we unlock uh, slavery and how we understand it better and what we now know about it. The, uh, here's a, a quick picture of slavery in the world today. Uh, it's from our work on the Global Slavery Index. Uh, there'll be a new number in about two months because we're coming up to our, our new edition, the 2016 edition of the Global Slavery Index. And this is a picture not of raw numbers but of density. It's of the proportion of a country's population that is caught up in slavery. But I think the important thing that you can see here is that there's only one country uh, that you can see that's not actually marked as having slaves as part of the population, and that's North Korea, and that's only because we couldn't get in there to get any data, and we actually have some suspicions that there may be a type of state slavery going on in North Korea. But it's important to say every country, except for a ti uh, some of the smallest island nations that we, but except for those, we're, we're finding slavery everywhere. I used to say everywhere except Iceland, and I said it in a conference not unlike this one, and a woman put up her hand in the middle of my talk and said, I'm a, I'm a member of the Icelandic parliament, and we have it too. So then I had to stop saying that. Um, I want to follow along for just a moment along that scientific process about how do we go along and make a science of understanding something as large and sometimes as amorphous and ambiguous and as tricky and hidden as contemporary slavery. And of course, one of the things that we have to do is operationally define what we're talking about and determine what's our unit of analysis so that we can begin that process. Now, this is an operational definition that we use within our work. It is based primarily on the 1926 UN, actually League of Nations, but then it became UN definition of slavery, which it in itself is also resting directly upon the law of property because that original definition in in international law said it's slavery if you can treat a person as if they are property. And of course, what you can do with your property, according to the law of property, is for example, you can use it, you can manage it, you can transfer it, or you can destroy it or dispose it and so forth. There's a, there's a whole long, deep law of property that you can use to, uh, to build indicators and operationally define what slavery is about. But I have to tell you that legal definitions are not clear. Uh, they're also in disagreement from country to country and jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, operational definitions are, are also not necessarily uniform. There's a real struggle to try to find ways that we can do work which is comparable across a, a world in which uh, different countries and jurisdictions define slavery in a very different way. One of the great powers of the Modern Slavery Act in this country is that it does not specifically define the word slavery. In other words, it, al it allows you to, to, to assume that slavery is what we've always assumed it to be, which is that complete control of one person by another. And that's important because it doesn't get you into a, f into a fight, which then ends up doing things as have happened in, across Europe in which criminal cases have come to different conclusions using the same definition because there's been contested or controversy about how to interpret that definition. The second thing that we have to do is measure prevalence. We, it's, a, it's a very tricky crime to get at. And one of the thing, reasons why it's very difficult is that even if you have crime surveys that were mentioned just in that <coughs> past session, is that you know, what they do, crime surveys, victimization surveys, give you the ability to estimate the dark figure of any crime. That is, you know, the, the, the number of those crimes which have not been reported to the authorities. But slavery doesn't obey the rule of dark figures. Uh, it, 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 it's not something that you can calculate because it has this one unique characteristic that separates it from almost all other crimes. And that is that it's not an event. It's not a crime event. Crime victimization surveys are based on the idea that a person is victimized, it happens as an event, and then you're able to count that point later. The victimization of a person into slavery means 
they become enslaved, the crime begins, and then it's a process, and they stay in that process, and they can stay there for weeks, months, decades. It goes on like this. And so it means that we can use random sample surveys in some countries in the developing world where the number of people who are enslaved is large enough in terms of that proportion of the population that I showed you in that first map. And we're, they we're able to not necessarily catch the people in the survey who were enslaved themselves, but we ask of their households, has anything like this happened to anyone in your family or in your household? And they're able to have this secondary report. But in the well-off countries, in the rich countries, and the UK is one, the number who are enslaved is very small. They're very well hidden because the rule of law is not that much stronger and it's more of a deterrent and a, a more of a reason why criminals want to hide them away. We don't have the families there in other countries often. And um, when the rule of law works, you, it's even difficult to speak to the victims who have, who have been found because they are protected by confidentiality and so forth. Now, very quickly, I want to point to something that uh, I've worked on with Bernard Silverman and other people in the, in the home office and we recently brought a new technique to how to estimate the number of people in slavery in the United Kingdom using multiple system estimation. And it's a technique that we borrowed over from, uh, well, we could say we borrowed it over from animal husbandry, but really we borrowed it over from uh, the estimation of casualties in areas of, of intense conflict, like Kosovo or Syria today. It's the same technique that's used by the United Nations when they say over the last three months so many people have been killed in the civil war in Syria. It's a, it's a, a Bayesian technique which allows you to work with different lists and use those lists to, to build up the estimation. The, sorry? Oh, it's not, oh, it's, well see, he's, that's why he, yeah, that's why he was president of the Royal Statistical Society and I wasn't, I, um, and some other reasons. Also, his math skills are better by, by far. But the point is that we were able to bring this technique in and use it for the first time on slavery and trafficking and, and come up with a number that I was very pleased that the Home Office immediately saw the, the, the power of using this. And we're now reaching out to other governments uh, who don't have quite the same guts about and, and forthwith approach to say, we want to take this technique on. Uh, but we're, we're out there selling it and trying to do what we can. That's what led to this new estimate of something like 10 to, to 13,000 people in slavery in, in the UK. But <clears throat> that's just the rich countries that we would normally use that technique. Around the rest of the world, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom you around the rest of the planet for a moment or two, I want to talk about other ways that we get at correlations, prevalence and correlation. So in a sense, you see, I'm, I'm walking up the scientific ladder from basics of prevalence now to correlation. We'll come to causation in a moment. Here's Haiti, a classic situation where we do have not just one, but three uh, on the ground representative random samples of a, the particular type of slavery that's prevalent in, uh, in Haiti, which is called Restavec, Restavec child slavery as domestic workers. Uh, we have triangulated the different studies there, uh, not all ones that we, that we accomplished. Um, and we have this sense of how many people are in slavery, about 2% of the population. The countries, in fact, that have the largest numbers in population, uh, of their population in slavery, Haiti is, is, is one. Mauritania may be the one that has the highest proportion, but even then we're talking somewhere between 3 and 4% of the population. So you can begin to see that we have a situation where we're, we've got a crime that may be making up around 36 million people in the world, but it's interesting to think about the fact that that's within a global population of 7.2 billion. So once it, at one hand, it seems like a very large problem until you put it in relative terms and then it begins to shrink down and you realize, my goodness, this is a tiny, tiny fraction of the global population, which I'll come back to that in a moment. One of the things that we do within the Global Slavery Index is collect a lot of standardized variables across 168 countries in the world, the, all, the, all the major countries. Uh, we do this in a way to uh, calculate vulnerabilities in exactly the way we've been talking about for the UK. We do it for the planet uh, in terms of risk of slavery and trafficking. 
we built in this edition of the of the of the in, of the of this of the index uh, a kind of five dimensional 31 variable uh, vulnerability prediction model uh, in the in the uh, uh, edition of the index which is about to come out we're actually up to a to an eight dimension we're bringing in into um, harmony with the United Nations development and vulnerability measures so that we'll we'll be all in the same kind of playing field uh, but we use that then to look at what are the key areas where intervention might be more effective. Certainly, when I began to work in this field 15 years ago, uh, there were a lot of conversations about what causes trafficking, what causes slavery. And the answer, of course, is different things in different places at different times. But there were a lot of arguments because there was no data about it, well, it must be education. No, it must be about gender. No, it must be, and so forth. And of course, it meant that very little could be thought through in terms of what would be the appropriate policy use of scarce resources if you were trying to find out which direction to point. And what we're able to do with the index is, whether it's for the UK or almost any other country in the world, is at least say, in the frames that we understand, we can tell you these two areas may not be your best investment, but these two areas might be your better investment. Now, sometimes we also get away from countries and actually try to understand what's going on on the planet. I'll just show you a couple of pictures to give you a sense of that. Here's a picture of corruption and its relationship with slavery, and it's, uh, the, it's one of those wonderful bubbles where um, the size of the bubble are or the gross domestic, domestic product of the, of the country and the colors are about the regions. But I put up corruption in particular because when you look across a lot of variables in terms of planet Earth and say what predicts, what predicts uh, that there'll be slavery in a particular country, uh, corruption is almost always one of the highest predictors, one of the strongest relationships. And a lot of it's to do with the rule of law. I mean, when you understand that in the absence of the rule of law, people can do a lot of terrible things to each other, but when the rule of law is sufficiently robust, those things are less likely to happen. Uh, one of the things that we see that demonstrates this perfectly is how when conflict breaks out in a country, if Syria uh, along the Turkish borders today, Kosovo in the past, and you see the rule of law dissolve or disintegrate or break up under the force of that internal conflict, you see a, a, an eruption of enslavement crime matching that destruction of the rule of law. And then there are some others that are a little surprising, like this. There's a strong relationship between <coughs> access to financial services and whether or not a person may or may not end up in slavery. And I know, I was puzzled by that too. Some of you have this puzzled eyebrow knitting thing that you're doing right now. But this we, for example, we found to be very strong in, in explaining why trafficking would happen in Europe and found this very strong differential between eastern parts of Europe and western parts of Europe. And the fundamental storyline is this. Uh, someone in eastern Europe is very keen to get out. They want to have some uh, opportunity in their lives. They're living in a very corrupt space. Uh, but they, and they think, perhaps I could build a business here if I only had some capital. But there is no place to go and get a loan from a bank. There is no savings in loan. There's, it, it just almost doesn't happen. There are centers where you can borrow money, but they're called criminal gangs. And when you borrow money from them, if you're successful, then they basically take the whole cake away from you. So there's a situation by which people who try to make a, a go of things in their home countries reach that point where they say, I'm not able to build anything in my life in this way, so I'm going to try and go to another country where I can take that, you know, take a chance and perhaps build a new life. So, some end up working in the UK, some end up enslaved in the UK or other countries. Now, one more step toward this time causation. Um, here's just a, a quick little diagram. I told you I'm going to zoom through a lot of things, but. When we looked at the 37 countries of Europe uh, and said, what is it that um, seems to be predicting the chance that someone's going to be caught up in slavery in Europe? You can see that 
access to financial services in, is in there clearly. State stability is also in there, which is a, a kind of proxy for corruption. It's about those countries which are, are, are having kind of dicey political situations and often corrupt. Freedom of speech is standing in there for other human rights protections and so forth. Uh, and as you can imagine, being one of the former Soviet Union countries, it tends to uh, concentrate all of those uh, problematic variables. And then you s get to this odd one at the bottom about the population over 60. Uh, it's not because old guys are trying to enslave everyone. It's not that at all. In a sense, this variable also stands as a proxy primarily for the rich countries. So countries like, think of Switzerland, where you have a much an older population in comparison to the rest of Europe, but also an older population with a high level of disposable income who want and are able to sometimes buy the services of, well, of all sorts of people and products, but can also use that to buy illicit sexual activity, commercial sexual exploitation, <laughs> uh, domestic servants, and so forth. So there's a, that's in a sense a pull factor. Now, there's the, there's the sort of standard statistical approaches to some of this, but we're also beginning to expand the toolbox. And you know, I, you've probably seen pictures like this. You know, I, I say, well, that's really a hot spot because this is from the UK where uh, the use of thermal imaging has been used to discover cannabis factories across the UK. And cannabis factories, as you may well know, are, dare I say, hotbeds of trafficking and slavery, very often with Vietnamese children and teenagers who have been brought in to, to manage these illicit cannabis factories. So there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's an interesting and significant move now in contemporary slavery work to also get that eye in the sky. Uh, for example, here's, I'm going to dive down into a particular area of work where I've been lately. This is um, a satellite photo of the UNESCO World Heritage Site of the Shunderban Forest at the bottom of Bangladesh. And it's a very important place that's been made a UNESCO World Heritage Site because it's the largest mangrove forest in the world. It's pristine. It's also the largest carbon sink in all of Asia, where this is where you know carbon is taken out of the air as opposed to pushed into the air. It's supposed to be untouched. It's been a, a, a UNESCO protected site for several decades. And yet, as you can see on the right side, the, sh the mangrove forest is still there, but on the left side, something else is going on. So let me zoom in to what's going in there. Those look like buildings, they're not. What they are, are fish drying racks. Fish drying racks in a very large fish processing camp completely that uses uh, child enslaved labor almost completely. So these children, as you can see, there are tall racks in the back or ground-based racks like this that make you look like buildings when you're up above them. But these children are lured into the situation, promised jobs, their parents are promised that they'll have incomes and so forth, and then they disappear. They literally disappear into a sort of, not jungle, but a mangrove forest where they're sometimes never found again. This is a, a very remarkable modern photo taken by a brave Bangladeshi photographer, colleague of mine, of a slave driver driving child slaves on the drying racks, using his stick to keep them moving quickly. He has to do that in some ways in his thinking because they work 10, 20, 30 hours at a stretch. As long as the fish are coming in, they're pushed to work, 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 and so forth. Um, they also, when I interviewed a number of them who had escaped, said, and I asked them what were the, the most serious problems they faced, they all talked about diarrhea and assault and sometimes sexual assault. But the second largest problem that they presented to me as being common among all the fish camps was children being eaten by tigers. Now I know that's just, I, I'm sure it's as mind blowing for you as it was for me as they began to explain this, but one of the reasons the Shunderbun UNESCO World Heritage Site is a protected space on the planet Earth is because it's the last refuge of the endangered Bengal tiger species. And when you, have criminal slaveholders who are also happy to destroy the, dis the natural world, and they push into the territories of these tigers, they simply replace their prey animals with new prey animals who are child slaves. Another bit of high level. Now, this, this one's a little harder to read, but you're 
but bear with me for a second. This is not a map of Brazil. It's actually a map of the southern half of the Amazonian basin. And that purpley line across the top is, in fact, the Amazon, the Amazon River. And the green parts of this map are the parts of the protected Amazon forest that are, that are still green, still uncut, and still the way we're supposed to, we, we hope it will be. And, and I, I hasten to add, all of the green parts are under legal protection and should not be cut. But the yellow parts of this map are all parts of the Amazon forest which are uh, under those same legal protections, very often international protections, some of them because indigenous peoples live there and so forth, but they have been cut. So you can see, in a sense, uh, a, a semicircle of destruction that's pushing in toward the center of the Amazon as those forests are cut. Now, the, the blue dots on this map are slavery cases. And the, sla and the bigger the dot, the more cases. So that when you look at, at one of the situations, I'm just going to point at this and right here for a moment. Big blue dot means more than 50 slaves were recovered from that situation. And then the red dots, which completely circle it, are known murders. And I have to say, known slavery cases and known murders. So you can see how murder and slavery together pushing in hard into an environmentally destructive way. I was with teams that were beginning to find the victims of those murders. So this is sort of forensic teams with the environmental police there. Now, then we want to link this. Uh, do I need to hurry up? I, I think you're running about seven minutes over. Am I now? OK. I'll be very quick then. I thought I was going fast, too. Here's the punchline from all the new work. If slavery were a country, 38 million people, 37 million people, it would be the equivalent of living in Canada, the size of Canada, or, or, or the state of California. If you took its, its $150 billion annual output, it would be the GDP of Angola. So we're talking about a small, fairly poor country. But when you add up all of the destructive forest uh, deforestation caused by slave labor around the world, it turns out that it would be the third largest carbon emitter after China and the United States. And this is that linkage. So I was told to make sure there was a rousing send-off with my talk, as it's the last one. So I want to happily announce we're actually moving from a simplistic, emotive, disparate, and disorganized study of slavery with lots of NGOs, which are often simplistic and emotive, and we're moving into a complex and logical and unified and organized type of approach. And that um, if you also engage in this, then you too, and here's the rousing send-off, can be one of the hero crime analysts, analyst abolitionists that uh, are, are working in, in our institute and so forth. So thank you very much.